friends, let me let me uh, uh, formally introduce Eugene. And I'm pretty sure you know him already because he's been in the field of auto pedagogy more than 35 years. In addition to his 35 years of experience as a class teacher, high school teacher, and educator of a lot of teachers, Eugene has served as a consultant of the Waldorf endeavors throughout the United States, as well as in Canada, England, Ireland, Mexico, Austria, Czech Republic, Italy, Ecuador, and Turkey. He has lectures on innovative ideas and education at the Goethe, Harvard, Columbia, University of Tennessee Medical Center, Rehampton University in London, and the Aspen Institute. Eugene's seven books and numerous articles have been published widely in the United States and have been translated into German, Hungarian, Russian, Czech, Spanish, Japanese, Portuguese, Chinese, and Italian. Over 50 of Eugene's lectures and uh, collections of student work, as well as many free downloadable resources are available at his website, iwaldorf.net. Eugene has also pioneered the development of the online conferences for grades from one to eight that have been attended by thousands of Waldorf practitioners worldwide. What a biography. Um, dear Eugene, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and that's over to you. Dear friends, please uh, mute your machines during the lecture, you know, right? Okay, thank you so much. Dear Eugene, over to you. Thank you very much, Andre. Whenever I uh, see the audience being asked to mute their machines, I think, where was that possibility when I was a class teacher? That would have made life so much easier. But um, I want to first thank uh, the Rudolf Steiner branch of the uh, Anthroposophical Society in Chicago for making this possible and to Andre for his excellent, meticulous facilitation of it. And I thank Andre for his forbearance because he knows I've been a class teacher, which essentially yeah. means it's not possible for me to teach or present anything in less than two hours, but I'll try hard to be yeah. as concise as I can. Please. So we are at quite a time um, of the year Rudolf Steiner's death day last weekend coincided with the Easter weekend. This has only happened four, perhaps five times since his death. And as those of you in the United States know, those of you international may not, uh, yesterday, the Northeastern United States, including New York City, had the most powerful earthquake in 140 years. Uh, 4.8. Um, we live the same distance from the epicenter as New York City. We are living on the countryside of Pennsylvania, but we felt it as well. And um, so did, although the media hasn't said a word about this, the, uh, the earthquake and its aftershocks were experienced in Bethlehem in Nazareth and in Emmaus. The media said nothing about this. Now these are all towns in Pennsylvania, but nonetheless, you can feel uh, something of biblical proportions may be going on here. And then all of this will be followed on Monday by a total eclipse in North America. Um, we're gonna be in the 90% range of that here. Um, and that will be followed by the next total eclipse, which will pass over Alaska, Alaska in Easter, um, April 17th, um, thereabouts, March 30th, 2033. 
But that's not the last I'm going to be saying about 2033, as the title of this lecture implies. Now, I want to begin by talking about a kind of uh, mystery in Rudolf Steiner's life. In 2000, rather 1907, Rudolf Steiner gave a lecture called The Education of the Child. That's how it's translated in English. Um, a lecture widely read to this day. And in fact, it's the opening lecture of Roberto Trussley's wonderful book, uh, Rhythms of Learning. And um, you can see it there. But he didn't stop with this first presentation. He gave this lecture again and again throughout Europe until 2011. So for four, nearly five years, he gave this uh, education of the child lecture, even though many in his audience were um, not married, had no interest in children, were too old to have children and so on. He kept giving this picture of what a school would be like were it formed out of theosophical or in our terms today, spiritual scientific principles. A wonderful picture very much in tune with the foundational work that he was to do years later on the first Waldorf school. But he stopped in 2011. He said nothing more about education until uh, rather 1911, until 1919, when the first Waldorf school was founded. What happened in those seven to eight years? Why didn't he talk about education anymore? Well, there were the conflicts with the Theosophical Society, the formation of anthroposophy as a separate endeavor. There were then the many, many lectures about the being of the Christ, where Steiner could speak freely. And then were the important lectures in the uh, early years heading towards World War I, about death, life after death, and reincarnation and karma, a theme that Steiner took up again and again and again in those years. He spoke about how after death, a soul ascends into the spiritual world and there works with hierarchical beings of all ranks, learning how to counterbalance um, the misdeeds, the mistakes of the past life, but also is working with those beings, those hierarchical beings, teaching them what it is like to live in a physical body in the physical earthly world. Experiences that they never had and never will have. So it was from both ends a learning experience and an educational experience. In fact, Steiner essentially recognized that our life after death is one long schooling. And in fact, our life after birth is no less a learning experience. And he said again and again, how grateful we have to be to be incarnated in a physical body where we can learn so much for our own sake, but for the sake of the higher world as well. In other words, he didn't stop talking about education. He just brought it into a metamorphosis, into another form, and was entirely ready to step forward and begin a school in 1919. So please keep this in mind that throughout the 20th century, Rudolf Steiner was speaking about education. One might say almost all of his lectures were education lectures um, up until his death. Now, in 1919, he began the school. Why did he suddenly come back to the idea of the school? He was asked the question, but he was asked many questions couldn't always act on them. I would wager that Rudolf Steiner recognized that the seeds he had scattered 
in the early part of the 20th century, specifically about the education of the child, that these seeds were like the seeds of giant sequoias. They were serotonous or pyrophilic. That is to say, they are seeds that cannot sprout until the resins in the seed case have been burned away, have been melted. Therefore, they love fire, they're pyrophilic. He recognized that a school could not begin until anthroposophy and indeed the world had gone through a fire process to melt the rosin, to melt the hard casing of the world that was not to return, the world of the aristocracy, the world of classical Europe. Something new was needed and fire would have to come in between. We can think about our own time. You know, there was in 1919, World War I had ended. Um, the influenza epidemic spread around the world, uh, bringing hundreds of millions of people to a state of fever or even death. So much was changing. And we might say a hundred years later in 2019, a similar experience was to be had by all of us as well. Another kind of uh, fire experience, melting the casing of older seeds. He also recognized, and he was only to bring this towards the very end of his life, that in the late 20th century, there would be what he called the grand culmination. I've spoken of this before um, here in Chicago and also in courses I've given. And the coming together of the Platonists and the Aristotelians who had not incarnated together before, or at least not since ancient Greece, they would come together to bring guidance and renewal to all of humanity. Um, there have been many arguments among anthroposophists, did this actually happen at the, of the 20th century? I would say, um, let's assume it did, but they didn't just incarnate as adults at the end of the 20th century, they had to be born. They had to be raised as children. They needed a school and Steiner recognized this. And we could see in North America in particular, the golden age of the rapid forming of Waldorf schools, the early 1970s through the 80s into the 90s when even public Waldorf schools began to form. What a rapid, coming together at that time of these educational ideas and the human will to make it happen. Certainly we could say that the grand culmination children were going to get the education that they needed, but then they grew up. The 20th century came to an end. Now they were working in the world. So the schools were less necessary. And we could see a kind of plateauing occurring in the independent school world in North America at this time, um, 2005, 2010. And now even something of a, a shrinkage is occurring in many private schools, charter schools, public schools, and other endeavors such as homeschool pods and school communities are another issue. We'll talk about that later. But certainly we could say that um, Waldorf education came into its own in North America in the late 20th century. So what is it that these grand culmination children were going to um, experience as well as their classmates? Let's look at the inner picture, the inner life of the Waldorf School classroom. And as a former class teacher, I'm going to be focusing on that realm, but it, it includes the whole school, of course, as well. We could say that when the teacher meets the child at the door, 
and shakes hand, shakes with hands with the child, that there's a, a kind of a rhythmic um, meeting of the adult and the child. Uh, there's a kind of priming of the pump of the child's rhythmical system as the hand is raised and lowered at about the, the heart domain. And we could also say that with this, the child's angel is awakened and meets the teacher as well. Then we light the candle, we say the verse, a, a kind of ritual is held. And here, the angels now start to awaken to one another's presence, making ready then the possibility of the children standing up, perhaps in a circle, perhaps not, holding hands, which is a task in itself worthy of a whole lecture, singing together, reciting together, moving together. Now the archangels are being invited into the room. The angels working with individual children, the archangels working where the children become social beings, group beings. And then the children are seated and they hear the story, the narrative, the expository presentation by the teacher, depending on the grade, and uh, later perhaps work on a form drawing. When they are seated, what happens in grade one, for example? What are the first words that the children hear the teacher speak as individuals, each in his or her own desk? They look up to the teacher and the teacher says, once upon a time. What does that exactly mean? Upon a time? Perhaps it should be once upon a time spirit, once upon an archon, this story was carried. So the children are now learning what has stood the test of time, what has passed through the trials of time, what the archai, who only touch the tip of their wing to a Waldorf classroom, what they are carrying. And it is these beings who are going to touch whatever little bit of flame is there in the child, the ego nature of the child. So the angels are meeting, as it were, the physical child, the child coming into his physical being. The archangels are meeting the etheric as it touches the astral and the archai, the astral, touching in the slightest way, the ego. So this is all part of the work of the Waldorf teacher out of his or her long preparation to make sure that all of this can happen as well as possible under the circumstances. And it should all be flowing out of the teacher, um, you know, not from notes or anything like that the meeting of the teacher with the class. But I want to speak of another aspect of this experience, which is rarely discussed. And that is the fact that not only are the children learning, and as the expression goes, if you become a teacher by your students, you'll be taught, not only are the teachers learning at that moment as they teach, but as in the spiritual world after death, spiritual hierarchical beings are also being taught. They too are learning from the children's experience of what the children are learning. They are having yet another experience of what it is like to be incarnated in the physical world in a physical body what it is like to have lived over time in one life after another, in the course of history, in the course of culture, in the course of knowledge, science, mathematics, whatever it might be. These spiritual beings are also learning. And indeed, not just learning, they are being nourished. 
by what is being brought to the children through the children. And I would go so far as to say, and if you were here last weekend um, to uh, view Florian Seidau's wonderful lecture on the Grail Mysteries, what is going on in the Waldorf classroom, particularly in the grade school one through eight, is a reverse grail ritual. That just as the grail nourishes all human beings and gives them exactly what they need, so the well-run Waldorf classroom is nourishing hierarchical beings. They are there for a festival. They are there for a celebration. They are there for their own ritual in which the human being whom they hold in such high esteem and meet with such hope, they can really experience what a learning experience is like for a human being. And this is definitely what has made Waldorf education so successful worldwide. But this, I would say, is also being threatened in our time. And this is what the subtitle of this lecture is speaking about, the war, Waldorf at war. What is threatening the Waldorf school? What is making it harder and harder for this reverse grail ritual to occur? And above all, it is the caliber of the teacher that teachers are no longer carrying inwardly the conviction of the existence of the spiritual beings who are in their room. The room is filled with those beings, whether or not we know they are there, but to know they are there, to try to meet them through the children, sometimes teaching the children a little bit above their heads, literally and figuratively, and touching those angelic beings in particular in a very living way. This is becoming less and less possible. We'll speak about this in a moment. We might say that up until 1919 to 2019, for the first hundred years, a good deal of this happened almost automatically. The beings were there. But with that 100th anniversary of the Waldorf School founding, and now with the upcoming 100th anniversary of Rudolf Steiner's death next year, 2025, we are going to find these beings will not come unwelcomed, that the teacher will be the bridge in the way that Rudolf Steiner in the spiritual world has been the bridge up till now. And this is one of the most significant aspects of the 100th anniversary in 2025. Very profound changes are going to be occurring at that time. And we can see they are already happening now because there is no question that Waldorf education has changed profoundly um, in these last years. Um, the festivals that build up the relationship with the archangels, they are not celebrated in the way they used to be. The eight year class teacher relationship, which builds up especially a strong connection with the archive, that is not there for more and more teachers. The class teacher is the only teacher in the school who has a relationship with the angels in the etheric, with the archangels in the astral, and as I said, with the at least tip of the wing of the archive in the ego realm. And this has to come more and more from the teachers conscious recognition. When parents feel that angels are not present in the same way in the classroom, safety issues come up. 
They feel their children are not safe. Now, in our time, they have plenty of reason to feel that. <clears throat> but nonetheless, they don't feel the Waldorf School is the safe harbor that it was. And um, when the archangels are not present, when the festivals are not being celebrated in a sincere way, when the life of movement and recitation is not really alive and inspiring the children, social problems occur. And the sense that my child doesn't feel included, the realm of inclusion, it becomes very strong when the archangels are, are not allowed to be present. And finally, when the archai are no longer invited into the room, parents feel, teachers feel, this school is behind the times. We're still living in 1919. You know, we're, we're in uh, that world of colonialism and so on. Very, very interesting how today's issues, uh, which people feel are coming, you know, from uh, experts, it's so much actually in the Waldorf setting, the recognition that spiritual beings are not there in the same way. So Steiner is pulling back. The hierarchical beings who accompany him are pulling back. And now it is up to the teachers, individuals in their classroom, we hope with the support of their school, to try to bring these beings back but in a new way. And this is a very positive thing for teachers to be called upon to do. Now let's move from here to um, what I implied before, that these capacities are being undermined, actually. Pre-COVID, pre-2020, there were already forces going on in the uh, world of Waldorf education that were starting to weaken its very foundations. Number one, the original sin, I would say, training centers at the turn of the century, and especially with the strengthening of the uh, public Waldorf schools, became and continue to be more and more skittish about anthroposophical content, um, as they have to bring in, let's say, more about DEI or more about gender issues. They have to leave something out. It's always a bit of a zero sum. So we don't have time uh, uh, for so much foundational work, so much orientation work. We, we have to get into the social issues much, much faster. They, they can read those things on their own. Um, I already saw this at the end of the 20th century, uh, working at Sunbridge, and it's very interesting um, that just a couple of days ago, they announced big news, we're getting smaller, that our teacher training programs are going to be shorter and faster, uh, requiring, in a way, less work on the part of our trainees. What do you imagine is going to be left out? What is going to be diminished in the wake of this big news? Very likely anthroposophical content. Out of the schools themselves came the fateful and I would say well nigh tragic decision not to compel class teachers to go all eight years because teachers felt it was too much. They couldn't master the mathematics too much history, too much to remember. The children in sixth grade were getting so difficult and, and so quarrelsome and so on. So little by little, one school after another began to give teachers that choice. And little by little, more and more teachers made the choice not to go on until it reached a point where it actually became a contractual matter. And finally, there are many Waldorf schools in North America in which a class teacher cannot choose to go all eight grades, but must stop at grade five usually, so that experts in adolescence can take on those quarrelsome, uh, difficult um, children 
who more and more are having their psychological issues and, and tremendous uncertainties and so on. Um, I say this is well nigh tragic because um, when a class teacher goes for all eight grades, one sees the continuity of consciousness that that teacher holds about the children in the class. She can still remember what they were like when they were first, second, and third graders. When, as the children would say, you loved us then, right? <laughs> you can still love them. This is important. They see you and they have a recollection of what it was like to be in a physical etheric body only. What it was like when in third and fourth grade, the astral body began to touch. They see it in you and you are, only, are also holding that consciousness for the spiritual world or the hierarchical, hierarchical beings in the classroom, they don't know the people coming in in sixth and seventh grade. They have to start all over again with them, and it may not work out that well. It may be working on the physical level in the classroom. Everybody's behaving, everybody likes science, fine. But it is not what Waldorf is really about, which is that meeting of the class teacher the child, the parents, and the beings of the spiritual world. It ignores then also the initiation experience of the class teacher, the possibility of working with the curriculum on subjects sometimes foreign to one, sometimes antithetical to a given teacher, working with that, working through that, and having then spiritual experiences on the job, having initiation experiences, not requiring an ashram, not requiring long periods away from the world, but right in the world, right in one's vocation. Very difficult to happen in just five grades. There we need the seven or even better, the eighth grade pattern to make that experience really come to life. It also weakens the class teachers as a group. It makes them less cohesive, less able to share the big picture of the growth of the whole child. And it is not surprising that some of the very biggest changes that have occurred in Waldorf schools over the last four years have occurred because the class teachers were not able to oppose those changes or modify them because they just weren't enough of a group. They didn't have that kind of political power in the school. Very, very important. The class teachers are no longer making the big decisions. This has shifted to the administrator. It shifted to the school psychologist, shifted to the school lawyer and so on. So the class teacher cannot be the bridge to the spiritual world in the way they were 10 or certainly 20 years ago. And also we have the weakening of the festivals, which makes it more difficult for the archangels, the builders of the social life, the creators of true social justice. This is why there's the sense that Waldorf schools are deficient in social justice. Not because the curriculum makes that happen, not because the teachers are antisocial beings, but because the archangels are not being invited. And of this group of the four archangels who look after the festivals of the year, the one to whom Steiner draws our attention the most is of course the archangel Michael, who is himself becoming an archon. That is to say, he's moving from being a being of space and social life to being a being of time and historical dimension and the meaning of the greater picture of race, the universal human race. Of all the festivals, 
the one that's had its name changed in most Waldorf schools is Michaelmas. It is now called the Festival of Courage. Nothing wrong with courage and Michael certainly inspires it, but um, you can have courage without needing Michael, but um, you can't have Michael without invoking his name and recognizing his being. So the most important for us of all of the archangels, the one who is destined to take earth evolution forward on his wings, he is the one who is being excluded, not even mentioned in the once upon a time Michael festival. And I wanna mention on the chat, I've um, listed some courses that I've given in which I go more deeply into some of these questions. Um, one of them is called the Incredible Shrinking Class Teacher, which goes far more deeply into the consequences of shrinking that role. The other is called Michaelmas Minus Michael, which goes again more deeply into the being of Michael in the past, the present, and the future. So you can see the URLs to get more information on, uh, on the chat list here. It's also very interesting that um, the Waldorf curriculum now is uh, becoming the villain and is being questioned and is being changed often once again without consultation with groups of class teachers, but on high from uh, the ivory tower, from groups of academics and leaders in the Waldorf movement. I'll be saying a little more about that in a moment. And this is ironic because what is the fastest growing facet of education, especially primary um, and middle school education in the United States, growing faster than any other type? Christian classical curriculum schools. And those are schools that, <clears throat> though they often have uh, they can have a fundamentalist basis or at least a, a strong emphasis on um, belief in God and, and the Christian faith. Nonetheless, they work a great deal with the great writers, philosophers, and historians of ancient Greece and of ancient Rome. The very subjects that are starting to shrink, be diminished, or disappear entirely as the Waldorf curriculum gets reformed. So we are so going against the time. It's right out there, you know, as it were, in the education world headlines uh, that classical education is the way to go. And Waldorf has that and so much more. And that's what we're uh, tossing out with the bathwater. So this is pre-COVID. All of these things were underway. Now, what about since the year 2020? What's been going on there? Well, comply, comply, comply. The schools have to close um, because of COVID. Um, just do it, no questions. Now, research is beginning to show that perhaps schools maybe didn't really have to close after all, that perhaps it didn't really make that much difference for children in the way they got COVID or not, whether they lived through it or not. Um, these questions are quietly being posed a lot, but the Waldorf schools should have posed those questions loud and clear. But even when they wanted to as individual schools, they were told by the leadership of the Association of Waldorf Schools of North America and its lawyers, comply, shut your doors. This is the most important decision made in the 21st century about Waldorf education. And it was a decision not made by class teachers, not made by groups of teachers working together, meeting, perhaps trying to 
give some contemplative or even meditative attention to this issue. It happened in minutes. And with that also came then the uh, order, the law that Waldorf schools had to work with media. That suddenly schools that had opposed movies, television, uh, recorded music and so on, were now going to be working via screens with their children. And the children, the families that had signed contracts that they would never expose their child to the media had to rip those contracts up and comply and go along. Once again, I heard from so many class teachers in tears, class teachers deeply discouraged, depressed to this day in some ways because of what they had to do and how they had to teach and how much of a backward step that really was. Once again, this did not really come from outside the movement. This came from our own association. And since we like to do things in a threefold way, closing the school, number one, media screens as teaching experiences, number two, what's left? How about denouncing Rudolf Steiner? How about calling Steiner a racist? and wondering if it isn't high time, now that a hundred years of Waldorf education have come and gone, if it isn't high time to uh, dissociate ourselves from that old fashioned colonialistic gentleman. Um, and certainly, um, even though that denunciation and statements from the leader of OSNA at that time, that Steiner's ideas about race were misguided. Now, um, who who was Steiner's guide? Michael, uh, the Christ. Um, we should ask them what, what their ideas about race are and find out why Steiner went so wrong. Well, that's been softened a bit or forgotten, perhaps, especially by the Osna leadership. But nonetheless, it opened a door. It opened a Pandora's box which I've spoken about in greater detail in lectures I've given uh, here to the Chicago group before, and is also uh, in that course about the uh, shrinking class teacher and another one uh, called Waldorf in 3D, um, which is about the uh, way in which Waldorf schools have followed the denunciation. It opened the Pandora's box for anyone in the Waldorf movement who had difficulties with Steiner, who couldn't understand Steiner, who for one reason or another just didn't feel like studying Steiner, for them to just say, thank goodness, I don't have to worry about that anymore. We're not a Steiner school. We're something different. You know, We're getting a few ideas from him, but um, we've got to catch up with the times. Those archive don't really know what's happening. So we hear things like, uh, there is no Waldorf curriculum, and a statement a few minutes later, the Waldorf curriculum has to be decolonized, often from the same person. Which is it? Is it existent? Is it non-existent? Um, and we have regulations in some cases, laws, particularly about LGBTQ children and how to work with them and work with their pronouns. We have tremendous pressures concerning diversity and inclusion and equity. Um, and teachers have to spend time, spend energy, spend emotional energy as well on trying to deal with the pressures um, from those social justice issues. And there again, something must be subtracted in our zero sum game. And what it is then is a deep understanding connection to anthroposophy, to what Rudolf Steiner really, really said and really meant. Interesting that these decisions were made in a kind of vacuum. Teachers were not in the school. 
when this denunciation occurred. Teachers were not meeting each other face to face or meeting the leaders of OSNA face to face when it occurred. Um, and as I said earlier, the kind of grail experience which can only occur fully in the physical classroom. It can occur online, but it's much, much more difficult and takes more energy than it's worth in certain respects. This also occurred at a time when schools were a vacuum. And out of this vacuum then came, when people came back to the classroom, big changes that perhaps they had been unaware of. One of the first and most dramatic changes was um, that Parseval was dropped from the 11th grade curriculum from a number of leading Waldorf high schools. Parseval, the story of the grail. Interesting that that of all things was considered less worthwhile for high schoolers to study than the autobiography of Malcolm X. A fine book, worth the study for sure, in history, in current events perhaps. Um, I speak of the substitution as X, formerly known as Parsifal, um, that it was in a way recognized that the grail ritual would no longer be occurring in and of itself in the Waldorf classroom. And into this vacuum in which spiritual beings are no longer active and no longer present, nature, it said, abhors a vacuum. Araman, we might say, loves a vacuum. And here in this time when Steiner has said Araman and his host would even be incarnating into earthly bodies, but certainly be working forcibly as forces in the 21st century world. Into this, we open up a space, making it a lot easier for Araman to take his place. So we have the, uh, the mix of the spiritual beings and the Waldorf curriculum and the teacher who is at least working with anthroposophy, if not necessarily becoming an anthroposophist, at least entertaining Steiner's ideas, that's gone, that mix is gone, which is as it were, the nature, the natural Waldorf school, and it's replaced with enrichment, such as vitamins D and E and I. Um, children, teachers, parents, and above all, hierarchical beings are no longer being nourished. Rudolf Steiner told Aaron Fried Pfeiffer, the founder of uh, Biodynamic Agriculture, shortly after the first Waldorf School was formed, that nutrition and education were the two most important factors in allowing initiates of older times to reincarnate and be active and helpful in human life today. Nutrition and education. Now, certainly if we think of biodynamics right now in the year 2024, it has remained quite faithful to what Steiner indicated and what Pfeiffer took up and developed further. Um, you probably wouldn't consider your CSA biodynamic if you saw that they were pouring Roundup on all the plants or using uh, artificial fertilizers instead of biodynamic compost. Of course not. And yet the education poll, Waldorf, is having more and more forced upon it um, put in the place of the living life, the foundations that are anthroposophical, and standing in the way, putting obstacles in the path of those initiates who want to return into physical bodies and to be educated in a real Waldorf school. 
it's gone so far that um, we can say that there's actual open opposition to the esoteric and hierarchical aspects of Rudolf Steiner's work. And with that, then the Waldorf curriculum gets dragged into that. Um, now, in addition to all of this that uh, before COVID, after COVID, parallel with this, there has been um, another sort of quiet, unorganized, they say, campaign also in line of decolonizing and dehierarchizing the curriculum itself. In fact, in Europe, we could say that however informal it might be, there is, especially in uh, connection with Alanis University in Germany, a kind of Waldorf brain trust, uh, a brain trust of some of the most um, gifted, intelligent, and well-researched individuals talking about changing Waldorf education in many powerful ways. I like to think of this brain trust as the one that has become uh, sort of revived in fame recently in the movie Oppenheimer, it's like a Waldorf Manhattan project. And uh, like the Manhattan project, um, it might not come to such a good end uh, if it really has its way. Um, as uh, James Baldwin once said, um, urban renewal always seems to be Negro removal. And I think we could say that as things are today, Waldorf curriculum renewal is something of Rudolf Steiner removal. Um, in World War I, as the war ended and the peace negotiations were getting underway, there was a boycott of uh, Germany by the allies which brought hunger to large swaths of the German population, including children. In fact, um, Eugen Kalisko, the first school doctor, actually started a kind of soup kitchen in the first Waldorf school because children were coming malnourished without breakfast. And this really helped a lot of children. And it can be that we are creating a blockade of hierarchical beings so that they cannot be nourished by Waldorf education. And hopefully there'll be an equivalent to Eugen Kalisko who will create um, a new level of soup kitchen, but it's going to have to be teachers doing this themselves, turning at least their classroom and hopefully getting a few colleagues to go along into a place in which Anthroposophy lives in the teacher, and therefore everything that's taught in that classroom can become nourishment and health for the spiritual world. Now, the leader of this um, change the curriculum movement, certainly one of the prime leaders, is a uh, very, very um, great Waldorf scholar named Martin Rawson. He's brought a lot of points, many of which I speak of in great detail in that course, Waldorf in 3D. But I want to mention what I think is the most important comment that he's made. And it's sort of a bit off the cuff. When asked, well, um, I'm a Waldorf teacher and parents ask me questions about reincarnation and, and karma. And, uh, you know, they want to know what Steiner said about that. And I, I know I'm not supposed to be saying very much about Steiner. What do I do? Uh, how do you answer those questions? To which Rawson answered, a Waldorf teacher need only be responsible for learning, studying, and then defending Rudolf Steiner's lectures to teachers. That is to say, from 1919 to 1925. The lectures given in those five to six years, that's all 
a Waldorf teacher needs, you know, to stand up for. Now, Rawson himself knows a lot more about Steiner and anthroposophy than that. He's probably one of the best read anthroposophists in the English speaking world. But it's again, this Pandora's box effect that um, saying that opens the door for training centers in particular, or at least colleges of teachers saying, wow, that makes our life a lot easier. We only have to study the teacher lectures, 1919 19 to 1925. We don't have to worry about reincarnation, karma, the Christ being, the two Jesus children, the whatever, 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 and on and on. Um, I'm not sure that Rawson meant you as a teacher shouldn't know that, but he's saying in his light, you shouldn't have to defend it. You shouldn't have to justify it. You shouldn't have to expect to be uh, an expert on it, but that's not what is happening. What is happening is that rapidly only the teacher's lectures and those in turn will probably be censored and cut here and there so that they're also more acceptable to the social justice movements that we're working with. Only those are becoming important. And this is why I began this lecture talking about those critical years of 1911 to 1919. No, there were not education lectures being given, but yes, every lecture given, particularly about life after death, reincarnation and karma was about education. And the first Waldorf school was built on those foundations. And Rudolf Steiner, number one, knew that many of the teachers that he appointed were people who had heard a good number of those lectures pre-war and shortly post-war. And secondly, he made sure that those teachers went to meetings of the Anthroposophical Society at night and went to the many non-education, in quotes, lectures that he was giving at that time. So this is a very mistaken idea to narrow the scope of Waldorf teachers when especially given the psychological destiny social issues that they face with children today, we should be expanding our horizons. And what can help us more than at least inwardly understanding the reality of reincarnation and karma? Understanding these ideas ourselves can perhaps give us at a moment's notice the inspiration we need to help a child through a gender issue to help a child through a racial issue, to help a child with their parents, with other teachers, with one another, whatever it is, to understand that destiny is at work here. And our children, according to Steiner, have crossed the threshold in a way that is new to humanity. And in a way, the spiritual world, including the hierarchies, are open to them but they can't make sense of it. For them, it's confusing. For them, it's chaos. We need to understand those things so that we can help. We need that soup kitchen, a soup kitchen for the hierarchies, chicken soup for the Waldorf soul. Now, I've got about another uh, 20 minutes to go. Forgive me for going on a little bit longer, but I want to share something significant with you, which has uh, just come to me over the last few weeks, maybe a month ago or so. Um, this is uh, a notice sent by the Association of Waldorf Schools of North America to its delegates. Those individuals, usually two from each school, who represent their colleagues in decision-making processes with the association. And this is what was sent from OSNA to delegates. This is the statement that we, the leadership of OSNA, reviewed. Share any input you may have 
so we can bring it back to the dot, dot, dot. It's not clear where it's going back to. So for a school to be accredited by OSNA, to be a card carrying member of the Waldorf Schools Association of North America, which for many schools feel is very important uh, for parents to recognize they're the real thing. This is possibly going to be um, one of the principles for accreditation. Quote, the founding vision of Waldorf education was as a force to address modern social struggles. Thus Waldorf schools commit to a path of social justice and equity in all aspects of the school, recognizing it is a journey of both moral and educational importance. Schools are engaged in addressing the historical context of marginalization and the endemic nature of dehumanization and inequity in all its forms. Close quote. This will be part of um, the standards for a Waldorf school to be um, accepted in the first place or uh, re-accredited by the association. When and where are teachers going to find the time to fill that tall, tall order? And what if a teacher doesn't agree that dehumanization is an endemic nature of humanity or that uh, children need to learn about inequity from where grade one, kindergarten, uh, when they're in the mom and toddler programs and so on? These are powerful, powerful requirements, and they have to do not just with a matter of choice from your association, but whether you can be accredited or not. Very, very powerful. Okay, I'd like to suggest, if this is inexorable, if the delegates will very likely just rubber stamp it, because again, the class teachers don't really have the kind of power themselves that they had in the past to work out of intelligence and to work out of thoughtfulness. Let's add another requirement. Quote, the unfolding of Waldorf education coincided with Rudolf Steiner's initiative for the threefold social order. Thus, Waldorf schools commit to deepen their understanding of the spheres of human rights, associative economics, and the free spiritual life in all aspects of the school, recognizing that these impulses are of world transformative significance. Schools are engaged in addressing their own efforts towards threefolding. When was the last time, unquote, <laughs> when was the last time that you heard threefolding mentioned in any context of Waldorf social justice, of, of Waldorf issues around gender and so on? It's gone. It's forgotten. Yet the threefold social impulse was absolutely parallel in time with the founding of the first Waldorf school. Steiner was speaking about generally every day, either meeting with the teachers or working with people on how to spread uh, threefolding and how to work with the political forces to make it happen and so on, often both at the same time. So important, so much a twin of Waldorf education and so totally gone. And I'd say here again, we have the working of Araman, um, throwing issues in our way, blocking the path, um, smoke and mirrors of things that are going to come and go so that we don't see the contributions that Steiner made to the evolution of humanity which in turn can help 
the very DEI issues that are being raised, um, not necessarily out of a Marxist impulse, but out of an impulse that is connected to human beings and connected to our work with the spiritual world. I told you at the beginning of this lecture that we go back to the year um, 2033, back to the future. And uh, obviously it's in the title of the lecture, so I, I really meant that. Uh, a year from now, in March of 2025, not only will um, we will be commemorating Rudolf Steiner's uh, death day, the 100th anniversary of that death, but this is also the time, um, early spring, when schools are choosing their new teachers. And first and foremost is the grade one class teacher. So they are soliciting applications or they are um, approving teachers who are already in the school who wish to take that step. So it's a very busy time, a very intense time right now in the life of schools. Um, so that means that whoever is chosen to be first grade teacher in the Waldorf school um, next year at this time is going to take a class, grade one, from 2025 to 2026. So that class will be there in the wake of, in, in the ripples of the 100th anniversary of Steiner's death. They'll be teaching grade two in the years 2026 to 2027. Grade three, in which they will be learning the children and the teachers probably the Hebrew scriptures of great interest to spiritual beings, grade three, 2027 to 2028. Grade four, Norse Smith's um, geometrical uh, work in form drawing in 2028 to 2029. Grade five, from the autumn of 2029 to the autumn of, uh, rather the um, uh, June of 2030. In that year, they will be teaching the pre-Christian cultural epochs. What else is going on in the year 2030? It is the 2000th anniversary, two millennia from the baptism in the Jordan. And the Waldorf class teacher will be teaching about the gods, goddesses, human beings, philosophers, artists, and so on, who were laying the foundations in Greece in particular for that baptism. And when that baptism is occurring, the year 2030 to 31, that will be grade six, in which the children are learning Roman history, Jesus as history, the Middle Ages, the so-called age of faith, we might say, monasteries, castles, knights and monks, Anno Domini, in grade six, as the anniversary of the baptism in the Jordan continues. Grade seven, hopefully they can keep going. They go on, grade six, seven, and eight. One teacher with, we hope, anthroposophical thoughts in mind. Grade seven, 2031 to 2032. Christian art in the Renaissance the figure of the painter Raphael, Joan of Arc, very likely as well, earlier. And then grade eight, 2032 to 2033. The children come into the modern world via a whole lot of warfare and struggle 
but awakening a new kind of consciousness is being born as these children learn about the world from the 17th through the 20th centuries, or perhaps even our own. This is the spring in which they will perform their class play, taking what the archangels have given them as social skills and weaving it into an artistic form that reflects their humanity. This will be the time of their class trip in which their angels and archangels joyfully mingle with one another for a last time and the children learn to really appreciate one another. Old animosities fall away and love rules the day if the teacher has worked well. And then graduation. The children now look back and look forward with an archai, with the archai and Michael in particular, we would imagine looking with them and teaching them the mystery of time. Who am I? Where am I going? What does it mean to be truly human? If we have the right teacher, the children in these years in particular, 2025 to 2033, will have a curriculum that is all about recapitulating Christ's journey to the earth and his incarnation. We could say that every millennial anniversary is a lens that intensifies the activity of the archive. An anniversary of a hundredth year, a, a centennial, this emphasizes the work of the archangels. And we could see all the hundredth anniversaries we've had about the daughter movements in the uh, past few years, um, how wonderful they are, how they draw us together socially. But a thousand year, a millennial anniversary that is exponentially greater in power and in possibility. There the archai get involved more deeply. And we might say in this time, in these next years, Michael will be taking another huge step forward, a kind of quantum leap perhaps into his new role as an archon and be a leader then of humanity on a new level. This is why the Waldorf School is here, not to convert everybody to Christianity, um, not to make all the teachers card carrying anthroposophists, but to recognize the incomparable priceless gift that Rudolf Steiner has given us not only for the grand culmination, but we might say for the grand beginning in our time. As Rudolf Steiner himself relates differently to humanity after 100 years in the spiritual world, and as the anniversaries of the baptism, crucifixion, and resurrection of the Christ being are celebrated not just on earth, but in the heavens as well. This is why Waldorf education is here. How can we support um, what it is meant to be? I'll leave you with that question. I think we're gonna have some discussion and uh, Andre, please take over. Yeah, dear Eugen, thank you so much for your wonderful lecture and um, how do you feel? Do you need rest like for two or three minutes? Maybe it makes sense to take a short break for a restroom and sip of water, and he will restore your voice a little bit, and, okay. uh, and we will start. So, so I yeah. have 3.17. Can we come back at uh, 3.20, 3.21, something like that? Yeah, that sounds very good. Yeah. Dear okay. friends, so three minutes to stretch your legs, and uh, please come back with your questions. Thank you. Mm. 
Mm. Mm. Mm. Mm. Mm. Mm. Mm. Mm. Mm. Mm. Mm. Eugene, are you reading chat? I am ready. Yeah, you're ready. So, okay. I'm re yes, I'm reading. Uh, no, I, I'm reading the chats. Yes, I am. Some very good ones. I'll try to, uh, you know, answer some people who, who wrote questions, but there are so many. I think there are 60 some odd chats or something. Well, like that. yeah. But, well, um, I mean, for, for this particular lecture, I don't think we will have any limitation. I mean, Okay. So you setting time because I have it set Saturday. Um, I'm yeah, I'm I'm happy to uh, keep going for a while as my voice holds let's out. Let's see, it's still <laughs> one fifty six people online, and uh, looks like we're gonna have um, pretty intense session. Okay. So, dear friends, we are back. We are back, um, and uh, let's make arrangements. Uh, how? Um, uh, yes, I mean, if you will put your cursor arrow in the bottom of your screen, it's um, it's a button reactions. Yeah, did you do it? And so, Andre, I'll let you. I'll let you choose the uh, the people. Okay. People. <laughs> oh, you will run the session. Okay, I'm good. So okay. just you know, this electronic hands they help him just you know. Uh, have uh, questions in chronological order, so people will have a kind of line. Okay. So, but it's up to you. Yeah, go ahead. How people will just okay? It's uh, John Beck is first, or okay, you, John Beck. I just want to mention before I answer uh, John's uh, question or the statement he wants to make. Somebody said, "Where are the resources that I mentioned?" They're right at the top of the chat, and they're supposed to be visible to everyone. A uh, meeting group chat will appear, and they'll appear in the meeting group. So I just give resources. Um, 
a, a, a course called The Incredible Shrinking Class Teacher and uh, an information link where you can learn more. Waldorf in 3D. Uh, I also give uh, the information page for that. More on the Archangel Michael, Michaelmas minus Michael, and the information link for that. And for those interested in gender and identity, some of you brought this as a question in your chat. Gender and identity, the dilemma of the divided soul with its link. So that should help. Okay, John, please go. Well, Eugene, it's great to hear you again. I've heard you give Thank so you. many wonderful lectures at the New York branch, and it's delightful that you are going strong and taking <laughs> on issues Thank of the you. moment. And I guess I just want to say, I also sent around a report from 2033 a year and a half ago. It's, you know, your vision is so important. And I also hear some things which which may be more comfortable for me uh, than for you, but I hear some things that you're really putting to us as challenges. I think DEI can be um, re-inhabited by the spirit of threefolding and transformed out of Waldorf schools into what it should be. I think the same is true of, you know, questions of identity and gender and so forth. These are actually pointing right at the Christ. So I think you raised a thing which I would hope the general section would come to life and join with the pedagogical section and all of these amazing Waldorf teachers and parents and graduates and take on these challenges. But thank you for raising them so eloquently. Thank you, John. And I quite agree. As I said, um, I'm assuming that something about DEI is going to appear in that accreditation document. And the question is, OK, let's then add something that can balance it and that can bring it back into uh, anthroposophy and Rudolf Steiner. And let's look again at threefold, which is so neglected by the Waldorf movement. Biodynamic farms, medical offices of anthroposophical doctors pay much more attention um, to the threefold aspects than schools do. So thank you for bringing that up, John. And thank you for your incredible work on behalf of Steiner, especially in the publication realm. Okay, Tom McGuire, you are next. Thank you. Um, I've uh, been an anthroposophist for about 50 years. I've been a father uh, to children of color for about that long too. Uh, I'm having a hard time. Uh, well, let me, let me just say, the thing that sold me on anthroposophy 50 years ago was Steiner saying in Knowledge of the Higher World, don't believe anything I say just because I say it, but believe it only when it rings true in your heart. And the things I read that uh, by him about race, never, not one of them has rung true in my heart. Uh, although I have tried to defend these things in the past, I've I came to realize years ago, I can't defend them. Now, you mentioned uh, Mr. Rawson in your talk. Yes. What he's done is a wise thing. He said he's not taking ownership of some of the things that Steiner said, or he, or he said that teachers should yes. not. Teachers should just take ownership of, of the teaching things and don't take ownership of the entire thing. I think that is quite wise. I don't think it's necessary to denounce Steiner, but rather to do the wise thing and not accept these things that he says. And I've continued reading Steiner, trying to find things that, that he says that would ameliorate what, what he said about race. And I just keep running into worse and worse things. And the word war, I think, is another mistake. Parents who are concerned about race, race and 
that's affected in the schools are not our enemies. They are parents who want to know that their children are safe, that their children, whether they are children of color or white children who are concerned about people of color, they should not have to confront a lot of race bias within the school. Another problem is that there are teachers who also do not understand what Steiner is saying about race. And they have their own biases that they sometimes demonstrate thinking that they're working out of anthroposophy. And that's 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 a, a huge problem. Over here so, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll end with that. Uh, I'm being interrupted. I'm being interrupted here, but I'll, I'll end with that. <laughs> okay, thank you, Tom. You're bringing up very central issues. The reason that I'm using the word war is not because I feel that parents are there with their uh, pitchforks and torches at the door. Um, sometimes I felt that way, but by and large, no, no, no. And I am deeply concerned that Waldorf really take responsibility for better work, more transparency with parents, a whole range of things for sure. The enemy I'm speaking about is Aramon and Aramon's host, that Waldorf schools, because of their central importance for this bridge between the human being and the spiritual world, that they are in a way, and because especially that the spiritual beings are working so closely or have been with us, that this is where Aramon and his host are certainly going to gather. And as I said, it's not so much the statements that have been made, like Rudolf Steiner made 52 racist statements. One might say in terms of today's consciousness and our standards, let's say that's the case, but it's what it opens in the Waldorf movement when that is all that people hear. And for those who struggle with Steiner, and I think all of us struggle with him in one way or another, he sets the bar very high, it becomes um, a pretext, not a conscious shrewd pretext, but often an unconscious one as a way of being able to reject everything else Steiner had to say, except maybe for the beeswax crayons or the children singing together. And this is what I'm concerned about. If this is going to be part of the Waldorf curriculum, if this is going to be a big part of what teachers need to study, and it won't be the end. DEI and concerns about gender are just the beginning. There'll be a whole long litany of social causes and sexual causes and so on. That'll all come. If the Waldorf movement has to take up each one and make that the center of its attention, and hire consultants and bring in experts and so on. If the trainings have to get the teachers ready to be able to go to schools that are concerned about all of this and little else, Waldorf education is not going to be unique anymore. It's going to basically be like a nice private school, liberal mode of education. I have nothing against public private schools. I have nothing against liberals, but it won't be what is unique about Waldorf, which requires that spiritual foundation of the teachers and the capacity for the teacher to go through those eight grades. That's the heart, that is the core. And that is what is most under attack, uh, I'd say by Aramon, because it is so central. Because if the teacher understands reincarnation and karma, then we can help the child find their way into the body they have chosen, whatever color that body may be, whatever social class it comes from, and head further into the future in that body with gratitude and understanding how much they are learning. So let me just give an answer there. Please feel free to join that Waldorf in 3D course where I go into much greater detail and actually do a textual analysis of a working paper by Martin Rawson and point out the assumptions that he makes, which are not necessarily correct. 
Okay, I'll stop there, though. You and I could go on and talk forever, I'm sure. Thank you for the Thank question. You. Kelly Corson. I am a teacher and work in some, have been working in some schools where the administration leadership is pretty, um, they're the ones in charge, kind of like what you're saying. I We don't have a teacher's group that really um, gets to be consulted with. Yes, so sure. <clears throat> the, the question I have is how do I then as a teacher influence or support or bring to the table these ideas in a way that I might not be, um, I'm not being so much heard or discount. I'm, it feels like discounted right now. Anyway, I would like it to be more um, when we bring ideas to the table that whole ideas get massaged and become greater than any of the parts kind of idea. But right now I'm just finding that many of the leaders or the administration and please, this is not accusing or pointing fingers. I really want to work with them. But they yeah. have these ideas of especially like what DEI looks like in the world and just um, drawing those things into the school rather than what are we looking at and some of the ideas that you've brought today, there's not a whole lot of room for that. I would like to be an influence for positivity and also um, bringing these ideas to the table more in of a Gertian conversation kind of way. And I'm not exactly sure how to do that. Well, it's, uh, I, I've been smiling a bit, not because I'm amused by this at all. It's a very serious point. And it's something I think you're speaking on behalf of quite a few, especially independent Waldorf schools nowadays. Um, recently, when one of these social justice issues came up, a teacher told me that she suggested to the school uh, administrator, well, why don't you ask Eugene Schwartz to do an online course with us, You know, do an online professional development day um, to talk about some of these issues. And the response of the administrator was, what? That old white guy? And I thought, oh my gosh, old, she's being ageist. White, she's oh being gosh. racist. Guy, she's being sexist. I, how am I gonna get anywhere with all of this? You know, it's very interesting that, that um, so I, I will tell you, I'm very happy uh, some of the courses I've done have actually arisen out of work I've done with an individual school, you know, answering their particular questions and so on, trying to present uh, Steiner's ideas or, you know, give him at least a place at the table in a way. I don't think it's impossible. I think in a way, you know, the deck is stacked a bit right now. And I, I would say that the flaws lie a lot with the trainings, which are in a way trying to prepare teachers for what is and not encourage teachers to carry within their souls what can be. But I also wanted to say this to this entire audience, some of whom, many of whom have uh, the gray hairs that I have as well. Um, because the threshold has been crossed and because there is this bridge, especially between Michael and the spiritual world, it is going to be far more possible for many of us who are here today to be helping Waldorf schools, but it's not going to happen until we have crossed the threshold of death. That is to say, that because that is nothing but one big educational experience, we will be empowered to, and if we develop in our lifetime now, a wish to at one point really help a local school, even if you've not been a teacher, even if you don't know anyone in a local Waldorf school or Waldorf altogether, that I think we are being recruited right now that we will be, to some extent, the teacher trainers of the future when we ourselves are spiritual beings. But we, in a certain way, have to really contemplatively, meditatively take on that thought that this is something that we would want to do as part of our uh, post bucket list, we might say. And I think probably this is the greatest hope that we have, that the unborn and the uh, past birth 
and uh, those who've crossed the dead, the death, as um, they used to say about uh, why Floridians couldn't have Waldorf schools, because everybody here is um, newly wed or nearly dead. Um, that's where the new hope for Waldorf education is going to occur. So you could see why Steiner was preparing everybody to understand death and rebirth and reincarnation. And then he brought Waldorf education because in the end, we have to all be working together. So thank you for that question. I hope that helps. And uh, I'm, I'm willing to you know, give it a try if your school were interested. Thank you. Okay, Kara, no last name. Hi, I'm Kara. Kara, sorry. Thank you for your talk. Um, you mentioned um, about teacher training institutions and um, OSNA and the pedagogical section hopefully working together. What do you see as the role of the pedagogical section um, regarding this topic of DEI and the proposed eighth principle? Mm -hmm. um, the language that you spoke, um, I know, I think it was Tom or someone um, gave us the updated language. I know they've been working on that in the delegate meetings. Um, and there's some controversy over it. Um, so I'm really wondering, what do you see as the role of the, um, the pedagogical section here in helping okay. to go? I, that's a very good question, very, very important. And you could see that I've not mentioned um, that group at all in my thoughts about the future. Um, as it stands now, there is a huge problem, which is one of these pre-COVID weakening issues that a number of years ago, OSNA took on fundraising, not only for itself, because even the dues of schools don't pay everything OSNA needs, um, but it also took on responsibility for raising funds for the pedagogical section. I wrote to a couple of members of the section at that time and said, that is a huge mistake. Follow the money. Follow the money and who's going to be controlling the pedagogical section, if not in word, at least in deed. So I'd say right now, the pedagogical section is not just there for Waldorf schools, public or private. It is meant to serve education in the world, um, in North America, at least for this particular section no matter if the school is a mainstream public school or a Quaker school or a Waldorf school. And being so intimately connected to OSNA um, makes this very, very difficult. I can also say that, yes, I'm aware that within the pedagogical section itself, there are those who for years have wanted Waldorf schools to be more activist in their relationship, especially to people of color and to racial issues, and now also interested in uh, those with, with gender issues. So it's not like it is everybody feels the same way by any means. Unfortunately, I would say that um, two of the voices for moderation, good writers, sophisticated intellectuals, as well as individuals with very big hearts, who have been moderating forces, um, trying to hold a balance against mere activism for the sake of activism. Uh, one of them has had to at least temporarily um, withdraw from his work in the section, and the other is probably going to be retiring before long. So I can't say I have a whole lot of hope for the pedagogical section. I have a great deal of hope for individual teachers that the anthroposophy that's going to flow into the schools is going to be more and more a matter of individuals. After Steiner's 100th death anniversary, the playing field is going to be changed. And uh, it is what we can do, whatever small steps we can take, whatever depth we can enter, and bring to our colleagues. So thank you for that question. I don't, I think there are a lot of people in the Waldorf movement who would not agree with a word I just said about the pedagogical section, but above all, 
look at this fundraising issue and I think you will see something that so hobbles the uh, the section and it should not be there. It should not be that way. Okay, so that was Kara. And uh, it doesn't at the moment, it says one other raised hand, but I don't see the name. So uh, if someone else could raise their hand or if we're done. Yeah, there is there is hand still is. Oh, okay. I'm not getting the... Uh, this For some reason, you cannot see the uh, right upper, left upper corner. Left upper corner. No, I guess not. Calista, can you, can you make yourself visible or start? Uh, to I can do. Hi. Could okay. you hear me? This is Celeste. Yes, Celeste. Oh, Celeste. Okay. Celeste raised hand. Fine. Yes. Go ahead. Hello. Um, I'm here as a parent of a uh, fifth grader and a seventh grader. And what you have described as a trend, we have um, experienced it, experienced it um, almost every single detail you've mentioned from the introducing of media to um, the uh, weakening of the festivals. We have experienced it all uh, between our two children, between being in an independent Waldorf school, as well as a uh, public uh, Waldorf charter um, so my question is that in, in this kind of environment, what would you suggest that us parents do to nourish our children spiritually? Because we feel very unsupported um, from the school. The relationship has uh, disintegrated between school and families and between teachers and families. Um, at times, it's a feel, it feels like the world of journey has been very alone, um, very isolating, um, because a lot of families have given up, um, giving phones, uh, letting the children um, basically um, roam free on the internet. The, the classmates have been very exposed to very inappropriate contents and hence um, bring it to the classroom and leading to behavioral issues. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you name it, uh, we, we've seen it all. Well, I can um, give you a couple of answers to that. The first one, I would say I, I'm going to answer um, with tremendous sadness, and yet also with a sense that within that sadness, it's going to be like those uh, uh, pyrophilic seeds I, I talked about, that the sadness will burn away. And... Uh, something will be newly born. And this is that parents leave the Waldorf school. If there's a group of them, they band together and try to do a small group of homeschooling. Perhaps they have to work with uh, help from online. Perhaps they find a teacher who in her heart uh, also has the concerns that they do. And um, they hire her. Uh, hopefully at, at better pay than the school gives, but that this becomes the basis for a micropod school, a pod school, a community school. This is happening all over the place. And I think that on the one hand, uh, I should be ashamed of myself as a, an experienced teacher of decades uh, you know, who's represented Waldorf education worldwide, who's lectured at schools worldwide to say, you know, throw the bums out, leave them. But I think probably until that happens on a large scale, when finally the schools are wondering if they have to close their doors. And in fact, uh, one couple here who were involved, were involved with such a school and have started um, one of these pods recognized this can and will happen, then the schools may change their way. Once again, I hate to say it, follow the money, follow the money. You are paying the school so that that school can stay open. You're paying that school so that those teachers have the time, however little, to meditate, to study Steiner, you know, you're not paying them for the job they do. You're paying them for who they are and what they bring your child. If they're not doing that, 
put your money somewhere else and start something else. The future of Wal the, the past of Waldorf education under the tutelage of OSNA and dare I say it, the pedagogical section has been become a corporation. Grow big, have nice buildings, charge tuition, get a good administrator with some corporate experience, have a strong, you know, all the corporate stuff. This is Waldorf education. For about a decade or so, that really worked. The future of Waldorf education is not allopathic. It's not pouring spiritual knowledge on the heads of people. It's going to be homeopathic. It's going to be small schools, small gatherings, home schools for one or two or three children. I'm seeing this, I'm getting, you know, calls and inquiries all the time. I'm not making this up. I'm not saying instead of private schools, instead of charters, because charters are getting very strong in their own way, but very diluted. But for the real essence of Waldorf, for the near future, I think from 2025 on, we're going to see a surprising number of homeopathic doses of Waldorf all over the country. Some will be more purely anthroposophical. Some may mix Montessori or whatever with it. Some may not be worthy of the word Waldorf, but the striving will be there. There are a whole lot of schools that aren't worthy of the word Waldorf anyway right now. So you might as well give it a try yourself and see what happens. And again, I am ashamed. I'm chagrined. I would not have thought 10, 15 years ago that I would ever be speaking to a group of, you know, 160 people or so and saying this with such conviction. But this is what I believe the spiritual world wants because Araman works with vacuums, but he can't work with homeopathic doses. Okay, so thank you, Celeste, for that question. Thank you, Eugene. You're welcome. Vanessa is next. Hi. Name correctly. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm from Mexico and um, I've been working here in the States for now almost two years and I've really enjoyed it. But my question was pertaining what you mentioned and it connects with what you just answered, Celeste. Um, if you're doing a homeschool project and I see all of these, like you're saying, these initiatives rising and growing and especially in Latin America, where to raise funds to create some of these projects is very costly. So we normally start small and start growing. Um, but when you're talking about how we call on all these hierarch hierarchical, my words, all these spiritual beings. Um, yes. <laughs> I can see how we can work in small groups with calling the angels and maybe through the festival, the archangels. But is there room to also work with the archive uh, level in such small pods, even, you know, like small families when normally it's a couple of families or sometimes one or three? The, can we do that if we're working in such a small group setting? Very, very good question. Yes, size does not matter. Intensity matters. Seriousness matters. In his lifetime, Steiner again and again scolded his closest followers. I mean, people who, you know, stand at the pantheon of those we regard as the pioneers of anthroposophy. And, uh, you know, and they said, you know, why are we being attacked like this? Why are there such problems? And he said, um, how how seriously did you meditate last night? Uh, well, I it was I was you know very busy, and you had told me to do. So don't blame me. Um, it's we have it. Humanity has crossed the threshold. The spiritual world is not gravitating around great leaders anymore. In a way, Steiner was the end of that phase. They are here for us. And um, Michael will guide us to the archive because Michael is finding his own way. He's been promoted, he's in training. 
and sometimes he's left on his own to see how well he does. <clears throat> so this is why Steiner is so intent on talking about Michael, and this is why Michaelmas is when the school year begins, because Michael is the bridge. So, you know, study Steiner's Michael imagination, study, understand why his last lectures, his letters to members were about Michael. And I would say again, for us, the study of reincarnation and karma. Now, Vanessa, you're too young to have to worry about that as an immediate measure, but um, reincarnation and karma, we might say is the mantle in which we can wrap the Waldorf school and heal its illnesses and help it move forward. It's not so much the direct thing Steiner said about education. If you're a teacher, you should know all that, but it's the very things that Martin Rawson said, don't study. And a speaker at the Alliance Conference in um, 2022 uh, said exactly the same thing, uh, told the teachers, when people come to you and say, I can tell you about the hierarchies and, you know, I, I know the esoteric secrets of Waldorf education. Tell them to go away. Don't listen. You don't need that. Public school teachers should have nothing to do with that. So this is where Rawson's words go, you know, one step removed. Imagine where that will go from the Alliance Conference into the schools. You know, taxpayers' money should not be going to the study of anthroposophy and so on. So um, we, in a way, really have to find our own direction and um, no matter how small that will help. All thank right. You. I just wanna say thank you. And it's so, it's so welcome. for the soul to hear someone brave saying what many feel and think. So thank you for your courage and your wisdom. You're very welcome. And remember, I don't have a job, so I can be very courageous. So many, and this especially in the leadership of the Waldorf movement, people love their titles. They love the flights they get across the country for all the important meetings. They love their stipend or salary. They're afraid of retribution, you know. So sometimes people will speak to me but say, don't you dare <laughs> quote me. Um, so don't feel alone either. But, but um, the money, the title, the prestige, and so on, this is sometimes more than a person can sacrifice. Um, Upton Sinclair once said, there are some things very difficult to understand, especially when you're paid not to understand them. And I think that the state of anthroposophy and uh, the Waldorf world is a bit like that. So thank you. Leon, Leon Davis, you are next, I believe. Well, on that thought, I wanna bring back a word you mentioned toward the beginning, comply. Mm -hmm. It seems like all these people are working to comply. There's a wider in, environment here, political environment. Just consider how the present administration of this country is introducing DEI into every agency in the government. And look how wonderful they're working. Um, we need to get a bigger picture in terms of the society, I think, which would we're, we're well, I don't know, maybe most of us are liberals and we're we're Democrats and so on, and we're trying to work with the, these people. But my goodness, um, this is a spiritual war for heaven's sake. We need to be more bold and, and like you say, not comply. Um, and there's, for instance, most of us are very, very, fearful about starting anything like homeschool it seems so difficult but there's so many resources now this worth looking into it and 
uh, I had to take both children out, out of Waldorf because of um, bad policies, bad decisions that the school made. And they were uh, educated in, in, uh, in a kind of homeschool with support and made it through all right. And I'm, a, I'm, I'm trained as a Waldorf teacher. My main experience is with uh, university teaching, but I've done some high school teaching in, in Waldorf too. And uh, I, I think we should just pull out of these schools that are complying to this nonsense because it's Marxist and it's not designed to be helpful to us, society as a whole, to the country, to the... Thank you. The, the way the country was founded, you know? Thanks. Thanks for a wonderful talk. Well, thank you very much. Now, of course, above all, as a Waldorf teacher, I want to avoid anything political. So I, <laughs> I you know, don't feel, um, I, I want to speak about the political aspect of that. But I will say that things that have been introduced since 2020 into Waldorf schools have come with at least a, a political wake and um, Waldorf schools have been finding themselves getting engaged in politics to an extent that are totally inappropriate. Whether DEI is God's gift to humanity or is a Marxist plot or whatever is less important than the fact that either way, it's going to have political ramifications and people will judge one another, not necessarily on their aptitude as a teacher, but on how racist or how unracist they are, yeah, um, you know how how homophobic, how homophilic they are, and so on. And we have enough complications with Waldorf teachers getting along and trying to work together. Um, it's very very difficult to add all of that. Once again, thinking about uh, if we want to get political threefold social order and so on, that's a uh, a much friendlier and uh, warm-hearted way of, of if you really want to feel follow a political path to help Waldorf education. So um, thank you. Thanks for that question. Now, I see Stu Summer and two others have raised their hands. And I see, OK, there's Sue, Stu. So um, let me take you next. Thank you, Stu. Thank you, Eugene. I wanted to uh, say something in relation to what Vanessa said a minute ago uh, about whether the archive can touch their wings into a small homeschool setting. So after 30 years of Waldorf teaching, I find myself in a small homeschool setting with seven children and a few teachers most of whom don't get paid much, so they're really doing it out of love. Um, and all I can say is that we begin our mornings with the college meditation, and it's never seemed so palpable to me uh, as it does now with these four other young people and myself that uh, whether or not we're great Waldorf teachers, we're really um, uh, striving to have a vessel together that that wingtip might touch us. Um, I think that's all I really want to say. Thank you very, very much for that and for bringing up that particular meditation. There again, that was given to the first teachers, but it is not just meant for a group of X number of teachers. It's also there for every individual to take up in their own way. And, and thank you. It is, you know, given Waldorf's tremendous social nature, social responsibility for the fact that, of course, we want every child in the world to have the benefit of a Waldorf education, but we're not there yet. And it may be, as I said, that we have to start on a different footing this time and start um, almost from the beginning. And North America is the place to do that because of our geographic breadth, because of the uh, difficulties of just having a school here that will draw thousands of children from the locality. 
Um, uh, America tends to have a quality of fragmentation that may not be unhealthy at times. And that may be the period into which uh, we are entering right now. Um, but once again, you know, our meditative life, our contemplative life, our study life, all of this can be of a help in uh, giving us the guidance that we need, you know, the, the leadership from on high, we might say, and from those who have already died and are still committed to the impulse of Waldorf education, which will give us a sense of what our responsibility will be uh, in a few years time. Thank you, Stu. Now, I notice it's past uh, the hour here, four o'clock uh, on the East Coast. Eugene, it's totally fine if you have a strength, so please continue. Okay. Yeah, just one, just, just one note from me. I mean, people are in chronological order from left to right, and Dave is, should be next because he's okay. waiting okay, for a long Dave. time. Thank so you for from being left to right. What yeah. I will do is, uh, the more questions I answer, the more numbers I see of people coming up. I'm just going to answer two more, uh, Dave and um, Monique, um, whom I've, I've seen uh, for a while. And then feel free to email me, you know, please, um, with your questions. I can't guarantee an immediate answer, but I will try. Or better yet, come to my doorway and shake my hand, <laughs> if you could do it. Okay, watch the earthquake, though. <laughs> okay, Dave, please. Dave, unmute, unmute your machine, please. You are muted. So sorry about that. Thank you, uh, yeah. Eugene. It's a wonderful reacquaintance with you. I sir, I you. I trained in the second summer teacher training. We had mm -hmm. ice cream together, <laughs> <laughs> and and I'll tell you, I've been following this the Waldorf my whole life since you know my thirties when I was introduced to it. I studied all the way up possibly before I went into teaching, and I was a games teacher for quite a while. This is uh, an ancil an ancillary question, but the role of the subjects teachers would be much appreciated. But the other thing I wanted to do is give a plug to your proposal. Don't know how much progress it's made, but in your last lecture to us as elders, that it would be wonderful for us to understand we are serving in a new role. I'm experiencing that role because I talk to old people a lot now. And that wasn't the case. I've, I've got grandchildren now, but but recently it seems like everybody has these uh, existential questions on their mind far more than they have in the past. And those questions have lived with me for longer than, than at most, I think, because I've worked with Anthroposophy and Steiner long enough to understand that he's not a racist, understanding that's probably the cheapest shot we have in our in our bank is to just say that and then all of a sudden discussion ends and it's so distressing for me to see discussion end because when discussion end ends that's when war starts so you know hopefully we're not on the brink of complete mayhem or chaos but your words are always resonate with me and i want to let you know that um i support that initiative to try and get if there's anything i can contribute to getting that initiative you know rolling um, old people have tremendous insight, and some of them have remained blind. But when you touch someone with experience, and you share that experience, they come around because they, you know, we, we were all hippies at one time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Okay, now I see Aaron is next, and then Monique, and then I promise I will be done. Please. <laughs> Hi, 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 Mr. Schwartz. Thank you for taking an extra question. I did put it in the chat, but um, yeah, I, my question is about resources to help us who are doing these homeschool pods to connect with trained and aligned teachers. Um, we really we we need some help, <laughs> and it's uh, yeah, it's not easy to come by people and to connect because the you know the Waldorf community is aligned through Osna and. Um, yeah, we don't we don't trust in that group, frankly. No, no, no. <laughs> but, but we but we need the connections. 
Well, um, I can suggest to you, uh, and it's not uh, entirely impartial, um, I offer the online conferences for grades one through eight every summer. A lot of homeschoolers have been taking those. It's all online, it's all asynchronous. You get 14 days for a given grade with double, triple, quadruple the hours that are given in a five-day conference in a training center, training institute. And uh, it's there's a lot of anthroposophy in it. And it's become, alas, kind of unique in that regard these days. And it's helpful for you know all teachers. Uh, we have a lot of Alliance teachers joining us still, even though the Alliance is offering its own summer trainings and homeschoolers. There are groups like Christophorus, led by a woman named Donna Simmons, um, give excellent help to uh, especially um, in the younger grades. Um, she herself is a Waldorf graduate from years back. There is Jamie York, Jamie York Press, Jamie York uh, Online, who does work particularly in mathematics, though he's adding other things. And his great strength, I've seen him as a teacher at the Shining Mountain Waldorf School in Boulder years back, he is fantastic with older kids. He's fantastic. He's a brilliant mathematician, but unlike many a brilliant mathematician, he's great at teaching kids who aren't brilliant, who are struggling. He's gifted in that. So there's some help. You know, it's, as I said, it's fragmented, it's scattered. I don't know if we want a big association of Waldorf homeschoolers, because right away there'll be the rules and regulations and so on. It may be better to allow the chaos to be there, to let destiny find who's going to help you, who's going to be, who's going to stay and so on. Maybe you'll miss the greatest homeschool helper in the country, but maybe you'll find the one who has the destiny, the karma to be your helper. These little groups are not only about helping the children and protecting them, they're also about adults um, getting a karmic connection and working with that karmic connection whom they might miss in a larger school. Okay. All right, last but not least, Monique. Okay, so I have a question that piggybacks on Aaron's because my background was is a class teacher, but when my children were born, we found ourselves in the unfortunate situation where we did not live near a Waldorf school. So I started homeschooling my children 10 years ago thinking it was a bit sad. And now I couldn't, I think it was such a blessing for my children. My question is, now that my children are getting into high school and I also work with, I also support homeschool families through a charter. Um, and so it's just a homeschool charter, but just a little note on that. We opened our enrollment six days ago and we have 2,200 families interested. We can only accept maybe 800 children, but that's just the, the, the need for homeschool in our area. It's, we are just, blown away but that being said now my children and the children I support we have done Waldorf homeschool pods through the years which has been wonderful there was always a part of me that was sad but now more and more I realize it was a gift um, especially listening to you which has been really heartening for me to hear you say these things uh, my question is as we move into high school and I still have children that I support and my own children how I know there's Jamie York, but you know my background is as, as a class teacher, first through eighth grade. Do you have any recommendations on how to support children moving into high school? Because it gets to be more challenging. We can do community college courses, but to keep that, and anthroposophy is very important to me. Um, Steiner's work to keep that spirit into high school. Do you have any recommendations as we move into that? Well, I, I can recommend the first ever online course for homeschoolers, which is called um, uh, History Through Drama. And that is a full uh, course given 
to a ninth for ninth graders, a parent can sit and watch and uh, give the assignments, which I, well, I say I, Eugene Schwartz, uh, it's, it's my course. There's a teacher's guide of 15,000 words about how to work with it. And there are, I forget, 20 or 25 main lessons that I give, full length main lesson presentations from uh, ancient mysteries in Egypt up to Thornton Wilder's screenplays in the 20th century. A lot about technical changes in theaters, electrical lights and pulleys and uh, round circular stages. It's a whole realm for ninth graders. It's been taken by a lot of students. Sometimes parents have hired an experienced teacher to also watch and then to kind of, uh, it, so what you're meant to do is to uh, watch a main lesson once or twice a week. And then the other three days with the teacher's guide helping you, you uh, go forward on your own based on what I brought earlier in the week. So it's a lot of fun and it's good. Jamie York is no longer simply bringing math. Mm -hmm. He's also bringing some uh, more humanities work for high schoolers. And it's one of the most ironic things in the world. David Sloan was a teacher for many years, English teacher, humanities teacher at Green Meadow Waldorf High School. One of his greatest courses was Parseval. One of his former students who graduated, went to college, got a Waldorf training, she applied to be um, a Waldorf high school teacher of English at Green Meadow Waldorf School. She was hired. She replaced David Sloan. And one of the first things she did was to replace Parsifal, the Grail story, with the autobiography of Malcolm X. She, she and her colleague, Green Meadow, is where that began. Other schools have followed. So David got very disturbed about this. He has now created a course, maybe even two courses, one for high school students, one for adults, because Parseval's uh, not an easy book to get hold of or to penetrate, um, online. And they're available through Jamie York's uh, homeschooling service. So look at this, Parseval, the keeper of the grail, is in exile from the Waldorf movement. You have to go online to find him. And David Sloan, one of the greatest English teachers in the Waldorf movement, is also in exile. I mean, he retired, but nonetheless, he can't teach in a Waldorf school. It's got to be online. So this is another direction in which Waldorf education is very likely, sad to say, to go. But it's a whole lot better than often what's going on live. Okay, everybody, <laughs> um, I'm not done in what I could be saying and answering questions, but um, I'm afraid my physical body may be done for the moment. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for those intrepid dear friends here who stayed on for the questions as well. And uh, I hope we all get to meet, if not in the flesh, at least in the spirit at some time in the future. And uh, thank you for your care and concern and love of Waldorf education and anthroposophy. Thanks, Andre. Thank you. Dear, thank you dear you. Eugene, thank you so much for your wonderful lecture. And in the future, please do not hesitate to contact me and we will arrange more of your presentation. <laughs> okay, oh, yes, you. please. <laughs> yeah. And do, you know, look at my website, iwaldorf.net. Very simple. You'll see lists of courses. You'll see descriptions of the conferences. Lots of free resources. You know, a hundred hours of, of stuff there. So, please feel free to take advantage of that. Thank yes. you all, and very Thank you so much for Ascension and Pentecost. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much again.